Usually I like to just introduce myself, say Shira, I'm a teacher. So I'm Shira and I'm here to teach as a teacher. Um, this is just sort of like full disclosure, designed to be a co-taught session. And I, I just I haven't heard, I have to assume something happened with Dr. Piron's, I don't know, flight or he's, I haven't seen him yet today. So um, we did prepare this as I would teach a bit and then he would teach a bit and then we would converse. But luckily I have the source sheets. So, um, so we'll do it that way. Um, maybe I'll start with just for a moment talking about, I guess, because you, you, know, you, you raised it. First of all, thank you all for coming, for being here. It's amazing to just to see the energy and how many people are engaged in thoughtful conversation, question and answer, and real robust dialogue. Um, my sort of newest educational home, I've had a few iterations of careers starting in corporate intellectual property law and then morphing into Jewish education. Um, is as director of education for 929 English. Anyone familiar with 929? Okay, so then I'll start with what is 929? What is the number, significance of the number? A beginning of a zip code, maybe, it might be the beginning of a zip code. In Jewish thought, right, in the realm of Jewish thought. 929. There are 929 chapters in the Hebrew Bible, in Tanakh. Um, and four years ago, for Benny Lau, who is a prominent uh, modern Orthodox rabbi in Israel, conceived of the idea of initiating um, a community of learning based on the chapters of, of the Hebrew Bible in the model of the seven and a half year Talmud Dafyomi cycle, where each day a different page is studied. So the idea was really to facilitate, to foster peoplehood, actually, right? that's what we're talking about. There were so many divides in Israel. We launched an initiative called 929, which essentially is a study five days a week, a study a day, uh, a chapter a day, studying Tanakh. Um, and it actually like, it took off in Israel in ways that was amazing, because this was designed not for the religious community per se. I mean, he's coming from uh, maybe more of a religious world, but really designed for like Israelis writ large. Right? What is something that can ground us together and our questions of peoplehood and questions of identity and questions of history? Well, it's the text. And I was just on another panel, I just kind of finished right now, we were talking about uh, how do we educate? Um, I ended with a quote from, I'll start here with that same quote, a quote from Fania Oz Salzberger in a book that she wrote together with her father, Amos Oz, called Jews and Words. And it's this great, it's a short book, a great work about text. And she said, Judaism is a text line, not a bloodline. Um, and while there are those that will disagree with both Fania and Amos, um, there's something very core about that. Right? When we think about peoplehood, when we think about sort of centrality, there's the text is a shared common heritage, regardless of kind of where we think or how we think it evolved, but at the end of the day, looking kind of synchronically where we are now, this is, a this is something that you know, can be an anchor for identity, but also a sail as to where it can go. So 929, and you can go to 929.org.il or download the 929 app. Um, after three and a half years in Hebrew of studying a chapter a day, it's a web, it, start it started as a website, where each day, starting at the beginning of Genesis, going all through Second Chronicles, um, each day there are between five and 12 pieces, short pieces, posts on the daily chapter from a wide range of voices from across kind of the scholarly world, the artistic world, students, poets, uh, architects writing about the construction of the tabernacle. And in Israel, it actually like it took off partially. And this is kind of thinking about Israel diaspora identity. Um, to shtetl in some regards. So someone has a great idea and then boom, you have 4 million followers in, on Facebook and suddenly the project um, just took a life of its own, not just as a daily kind of website that, you know, and an email list and Facebook and kind of, but actually communities of learners. So it's 929 communities that popped up all over the country and not in like the likely places of you know, the Beit Midrash or the synagogue. Yes, they're in those places, but in the president's house, we get now, I know it's crazy, but like there's a, you know, because I'm on the official 929 team, every month there's a monthly Chug Tanakh, right? A small learning group in the president's residence to study the 929 chapters of that 
right, of that past month, and in bars and in cafes um, across the country. So after, you know, from the beginning, there was a question of whether this project, what it would look like to have an English language version of this project. And the project actually is one that speaks very much to identity and peoplehood, right? It's the, the, the content is sourced from a diverse range of voices across Israel, and so initially, the thought was maybe just parallel, you know, have a parallel English site and translate the pieces. Um, but that actually wouldn't bring the mission of the project, which was, well, what do, we, what do English, like, what does the global English-speaking world have to say about this text? And so this past July, it was kind of a rushed launch in quick Israel startup mode. We launched the English language version of 929. And since then, and I was brought in, um, the director, Rabbi Adamance, is teaching another parallel session right now. And it has been this incredible project of just bringing a diverse range of voices of you know, biblical archaeologists and 10th grade students who have what to say on um, on on the Bible on the text, and both from like artistic representation, filming in different places, music videos, spinning lyrics, and and really just like thoughtful short pieces. So I invite everyone, kind of as the, just the opening. You mentioned nine to nine, so I can't not um, talk about it when we talk about engaging with peoplehood in that core text. Um, to visit nine to nine, sign up for the listserv, visit on Facebook, social media channels. Uh, when you're in Israel, it kind of defaults directly to the Hebrew site. And outside of Israel, it'll default directly to the English site. The content is different. Um, we have partnered with Safaria. So the material is linked. Both the translation is a new JPS translation um, in the English. And Safaria kind of source sheets, if people worked you know, beyond the text or craft all source sheets, those will be linked to the daily chapter. And what this does actually is it kind of enables you to zoom in and people often think like, well, let's look at the book as a whole. Um, but there's something very different when you say, well, Leviticus chapter 15, which was Friday, the Thursday's chapter, um, it's really technical. It's about all kinds of right, unusual sexual emissions and discharges that make a person impure. Right? Like That's a crazy chapter to kind of look at qua chapter right? in the context of temple-centric holiness, right? And contextualized, there's a lot to say about it. Um, and then suddenly when you pull it out as a chapter, well, what, is this, what does this mean for the text and ritual kind of regulating the core of human experience, right? Like that chapter is actually like the most human chapter you can possibly have in the Bible, right? About our bodies and crazy things that happen with our bodies and how they're ritualized um, and regulated in the temple. So, so the project is one that is, you know, it's a global, large scale, but also kind of zooming in on individual chapters. So we will start, actually, in today's discussion, which is not about 9 to 9. Um, here, you can give this out. Um, we titled this The Punishment of Exile, The Blessing of Diaspora, a Text Study. And what was really nice about preparing this um, together with Dr. Piron, although unfortunately not here, but we, this was a project of preparing a text, right, a, a text class um, that was done with one foot in the diaspora and one foot in Israel through Zoom conference calls, where we kind of hashed out certain ideas, met each other for the first time over our computers, and then had a chavruta, really learned together and, and pulled sources to, to, you know, to reflect upon the question of what does the text right, have to say about, right, foundational texts have to say about the question of, um, of diaspora. So what we wanted to do today was really situate this conference in you know, anchor it in core foundational, in core foundational texts. Um, we have always kind of, as a Jewish people, been thinking about the diaspora, right? These are not new questions. These are questions that Jews have been dealing with for thousands of years, as Jews as a diasporic people. And, um, and we wanted to look at classic sources 
not so much to reinvent the wheel, right, in terms of what things look like today, but really to illuminate and see how Jews first grappled with these, right, with the question of diaspora from the from the earliest experiences. Um, I guess, you know, this is not a history of interpretation. It is by no means all the texts that have to do with diaspora or the diasporic experience, but just certain, you know, selected texts to see how our core foundational texts have, have navigated um, the question of diaspora. And so I wanted to start with the book of Leviticus, chapter 26, 33, uh, because in so many ways, the point of departure in the Bible is of exile as punishment. And that's a really, like, it's, it's foundational to say the first, right, when, when we think about exile, when we think about diaspora, it's always in the Bible, right? It's been often in the context of, right, of punishment. Um, you know, if you're a Second Temple Jew, hi, <laughs> how are you? It was good. Oh, you just finished up. Okay. We jumped in a little bit. <laughs> You just get mic'd up, and then and then make you want to introduce him. Okay, so we haven't quite gotten into this. Right? Well, I was going to open. Okay, so maybe I'll just open up with a question, and then we'll kind of work with that way. Um, well, let's take a look at this text. Now, this is actually the one chapter in Leviticus that is not. Um, it's neither legal nor ritual in its character. So throughout the book of Leviticus, it's all right, temple law, ritual, purity, law, uh, you know, and this is the one, right, the one chapter that's not ritual nor neither legal. It is the chapter beginning of Prashat Bhukotai. It's really like the epilogue to you know the holiness section, the holiness code. And here we have Right? the blessings and the punishments as to if you don't listen, if you're not engaged in, in what in the preceding chapters. We're going to be interrupted. It's opening, okay, it's okay. Opening the beginning and then we're going to jump right, right back to the beginning. Maybe you do it alone. It's wonderful. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's just read it. I'll read it in Hebrew and then we'll read it together in English. V'etchem hazareh bagayim v'harikoti acharechem chara v'hayta arzachem shmama v'arechem yu charba. And you I will scatter among the nations, and I will unsheath the sword against you. Your land shall become a desolate, and your cities a ruin. Right? The Israelites are told that if they, right, if they listen, they'll get blessings, and there'll be an abundance in the land. And if not, then the curse is, right, we have the more space devoted to the curse than to the blessing in this context, that um, the ultimate punishment being banishment from the land and you know, prolonged exile and the danger actually of collective extinction. So sort of the point of departure when we think about the idea of diaspora, and we're deliberately actually using the word exile in this context, which is interesting. We have some linguists in the room. Um, when we think about in Hebrew, we have the word galut, which we don't really have two separate words, whereas in English, we can offset and talk about exile versus diaspora. And we have very different connotations when we think about exile vis-a-vis -vis diaspora. Those are different, right? and we'll hopefully illuminate some of that complexity and some of that nuance together. Um, but if you, you know, if you, for example, are a Second Temple Jew and find yourself, you know, the Talmud hasn't been written yet, there hasn't been a reflection on what a diasporic experience, um, what do you say about exile when the context and the introduction is all in the context um, of punishment? And so I wanted to open with a question, and then we'll backtrack a bit. Why is banishment from a place or banishment from the land an appropriate punishment for something? Right? How does it help? Is it for suffering? Because if it's for suffering, then it's just a matter of, you know, that works for a generation or two until you're actually very comfortable somewhere, and then it's no longer kind of, right, it work, then it no longer works as, as suffering. Right? What is it about banishment? Mm -hmm. This is Chavruta, so let's. <laughs> just what's your name, sorry? Pardon? What's your name? Joan. Okay, Joan, great, thanks. It's not as specific to a place, but being scattered means being separated from. Okay, so the sort of theocentric. Right, you, well, but you. Okay, so the presence of God in a place, but God is playing an important role then in that banishment from that place, right? And and it's it's great, and it's no, 
you know, this is just one, you know, just one verse where we have banishment as punishment, but it's, it's, it's in the context of Leviticus. What is Leviticus about? Rules about the temple, the service of God. Where do we find God? How do we construct that sacred space for God? So in many ways, when we think about Right. And so the punishment then is fitting, right? If you don't follow these, that's space, right? We're thinking all about kind of how to construct and define that sacred space, then you're banished from that space because you're far from God. Okay. Another one or two? Then comes to that. Okay, amazing. You have that, right, the, the social construct there is actually um, scattered and dispersed in a way that we can actually argue, one of the end sources will argue, right, the benefits of that, but, right, as a launching point, well, this is a punishment because, right, you're together, you build something as a community, and then suddenly the social norm is then splintered, and you can no longer do what you could have done when you were a cohesive group. Oh, sorry, yeah, what's your name? David. 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 <laughs> They're also um, removing an idea that you don't agree with from having any influence in the community. What is that idea? What do you mean? You want to tease that out a little bit more? If you think that somebody is, um, is encouraging sedition or rebellion, then you can just exile them. Okay, great. So an individual, and we do have examples of what, what do we do with that, you know, with the blasphemer, right, sure. exactly, or right, the mechalal, the blasphemer who said, right, and and so that's an individual, um, right, an individual exile. So when we talk about exile, we can actually talk about it as communal dispersion with the danger and threat of ultimate possible extinction, um, but also on an, on a very personal individual level. Um, Okay, great. So we're going to look a bit about the scattering, what that, right, is that actually? I mean, we did title this The Punishment of Exile, The Blessing of a Diaspora. That was kind of an opening question. I do want to acknowledge, <laughs> no, go back to our beginning, because I, I talked know. about how nice it was to have Chavrita with one foot in diaspora, one foot in Israel. No, but, um, but, but I think the process, well, we will have yeah, introduced, and then we'll... we'll <laughs> why why we can't sit things. together? Yeah. Yes. Ulan se magar, magar de varos. Perfect. I got it. Okay. Drag me side. Okay. Go shop. So guys. Wait a minute. So Rabbi Shai Piron is the chairman of uh, PINIMA, the movement, uh, and a dean and vice president of UNO Academic College. In 2016, he was vice chairman of the Knesset. So give due to a legislator. Um, of, uh, he was the minister of education of Israel's 33rd government, probably had something to do with my cousin, Meir Porsche. He was a member of the Committee of Ministers Legislation, head of Council for Higher Education. He's co-founder of the Zohar Organization, which works to bring together... <laughs> yeah, you can read Wikipedia, but uh, this is my job. Uh, uh, but I get paid for this. Um, which works to bring together religious and secular Jews at Zohar. And he's still part of the leadership. Piron has a great, Rabbi Piron has a great deal of experience in education as rabbi, teacher, and principal. And uh, I, th I just think this is an amazing session. Okay, I, I think that, first of all, you know, I am out of the context. Uh, I show today uh, Rabbi Jonathan Zachs uh, talk to you uh, from film. And he do it in English. And last year, I heard him, he gave a lesson in Israel in Hebrew. And it's not the same Rabbi Zaks. 
So I feel like Rabbi Zaks because now I have to teach in English. So for me, it's not same shy. But let me say that the question is not if we talk about community, we talk about family. And it's not the same thing. The land of Israel is not land, is not country, it's home. And it's not the same. When we talk about Israel, we talk about home and brother who sit together in the same home. And when you take someone and say, go out from my home, it's a terrible situation. So we can talk about nations, we can talk, we can talk about community, and we can talk about family. Now, if we read in this Shabbatot, Chumash Bereshit, Genesis, all the Chumash is about family. It's not about community. It's not about nations. It's about family. So let's think about this, this position. Let's think about this position. It's not the same position. All right? I think we, yeah, come on a second. We have some. Shalom, Betty. You know, we touched upon some of that in thinking about what it means to be thrown out of the family. Right? When you think about the core part of the familial unit in these partials, when we talk about the sale of Joseph, that you, you raised the, you know, the sort of not just the geographic question, but the social question, right? the cohesion question, what we can do when we're a unit of tribes, and then suddenly right, you no longer are. Um, Okay. But my folk is like my, my, my group, right? my people, my people. But my folks is actually used for parents. But you know, I, I have a wonderful example for you. Let's do it briefly, okay? We started in Chumash Bereshit. We start with Cain and Hevel, then Abraham and Ishmael, then Yitzchak and Esav, then uh, Yaakov and Esav, and then all the 12 tribe. And in the end of the the Chumash, we, we know two names, Ephraim and Menashe. You know something about these two brothers? Something, you can tell me something about them? Something, but you can, any story, something? So every Shabbat, I take my two hands and I put it on the head of my son and I say, Yisimcha Elohim ke Ephraim Menashe. Who is this Ephraim Menashe? Who is them? Not Abraham? Not Yitzchak, not Jacob. You know why? This the first two brothers, they are not fight. In Bereshit. It's the first, it's a, we, 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 the Bible don't say nothing about fight of them, okay? Abraham fight, first Noah fight, Cain and Abel fight, um, Yitzchak fight, Yaakov fight. The 12 tribe fight. The first two brothers is a fight on Nashe. So every Shabbat, what Jewish mother say to the brother, please, don't fight. <laughs> That's family. Relocated. <laughs> Like we Relocation. Okay. It was split. But it was almost to keep. But it was to keep. And it wasn't because they were, you know, fighting per se. But it was to maintain. But you know, no. But you know, because because it's home. It's not home. Home. It's feeling. Because you know, you can marry. You have child, grandchild, and when you came to your parent, you say, I came home. All right? So you can live in America, in French. When you came, Israel, you came home. All right? 
It's not the same. It's interesting. I think maybe this that raises certain their core issues, right? If we think about familial relationships throughout the book of Genesis and you say there's something core about arguing, right? About competition. That's essential. They kind of have like an enable is about like the competitive nature for whatever their motive was, but there's right, the competition, there are core parts of of being human. Um, I just invite you to look at you know a, a, an early source. It's a fifth century midrash on the Book of Lamentations that actually says there's something very core about being thrust from a land. Um, you know, read it. Rabbi Bahu, in the name of Rabbi Yossi Bar Hanina, said, "But they, like men, have transgressed the covenant." Interpreting a, a verse in the Book of Hosea, later prophets, Vehema Adam of of Rubrit, talking about the Israelites sinning, he says they like men, the word Adam there being translated as men, the homiletic rabbinic interpretation of this jumps and says, well, this is Adam. Adam there is not actually man, but this is the first man. Who is that man? Adam. God said, Adam, I brought him into the Garden of Eden and commanded him, and he transgressed my commandments, and I sentenced him to banishment, and his sons too. I brought them into the land of Israel and commanded them, and they transgressed my commandments, and I sentenced them <laughs> to banishment. So, you know, there, there was a wide range of interpretations of rabbinic, you know, metaphors and discussions on kind of the launching point of the Bible um, as exile as punishment. I thought this one was kind of really interesting. I wanted to, to pull it out because it, it really hits on that there's something core, right? There's a core part um, of being human that's highlighted in this interpretation, right? From saying that Adam is not man, but that Adam is Adam. And so we were destined from the beginning, right? Banishment essentially is an, an inevitable part of the core experience of being human from time immemorial is actually, it's, it's fascinating to kind of reflect upon. Like, what does that mean to say, yes, to be kicked out of a land is, is actually kind of predictable. And so the first human ever to be bound in a land was punished and kicked out of that land and are, and subsequently, uh, so will his son. I have a question. How does the covenant play into the family? I believe. Uh, we have a legal obligation with God. We didn't keep up part of the bargain. So we were banished. I don't know about only family because you talk about the first five chapters of Tomash. Um, it's also all about the covenant. I believe we have a legal obligation to sign the cross. I think that the question is is if the our land is lighthouse or Interpretive because we need some lighthouse to show all the world how to be in the best place in the best countries, or we build the house because we're afraid from the going. So we build together house in Israel. It's a big question because uh, Shira uh, talk about uh, Adam Arishon. Nobody knows if Gan Eden was in Eretz Israel, It's Machloket. Okay, so Saddam Hussein was the Prime Minister of Gan Eden, <laughs> the President of Gan Eden. So it's a very big question why Gan Eden is not in Jerusalem. Why Gan Eden is not the place of Bet HaMikdash? But what's so interesting about the description, okay. Okay. We do have, no, just to, to build on that, you do see, though, the Beit HaMikdash in its like construction actually has sort of relics to make it almost like the Ganites, right? You'll have the pomegranates on top of the pillars and the, almost the trees that are standing there at the entrance so that we do have this sense of even if we don't know where it is, there is a grounding and wanting to make right, that parallel of the Beit HaMikdash and Ganites and in the Garden of Eden. And I think it raises questions also, I mean, what is the covenant, right? The covenant is it's not so much about the land, per se, as it is, right? The breeds is right, the Torah. Right? And so there, I think it, that's how it can kind of relate to that question as to, well, what is the subject core of the covenant? That's a Rabbi Sachs covenant and conversation kind of. Um, but we do see, and I, I'll just, you know, work a little bit through some text that I thought were illuminating and then pass over um, to Shai. 
we do see, you know, we started with this launching points of anybody who reads the Bible is at home in the Bible sees exile as punishment, but actually things really start to shift. Uh, people don't just, in, in sort of history of interpretation and rabbinic thought, we see a lot of varied opinions as to dispersion as not so much punishment, perhaps blessing, um, and even as in this, you know, the next selection as universal mission. And so we start seeing sort of a development, and this is from the Talmudic period, uh, the idea that there's a core reason why we are out of the land. And that's really what we're, when we talk about a homeland and we talk about the need for a diaspora. So we have early relics already of that from right the third, fourth century, fifth century Talmud, uh, you know, from the Mishnah in the second century, and then later on in the Talmud, you know, what that reason might be. And there are varied reasons. Here's just one from the Babylonian Talmud from Tractate Psachim. Read it. And Rabbi Lezer said, the Holy One, blessed be he, exiled Israel among the nations only so, so that converts would join them, as it is stated, and I will sow her to me in the land. Does a person sow a se'ah, unit of measurement, of grain for any reason other than to bring in several core of grain during harvest? 30 se'ah is, a, is a, a core. So to the exile is to enable converts from the nation to join the Jewish people. We don't usually think of Judaism as right, a proselytizing religion. And yet, we have this sense of right, a rabbinic reflection on, well, we're here. We're living in this really vibrant diaspora in Babylonia. Right? We studied the Babylonian Talmud. Things were, were actually pretty good. I mean, and we start reflecting on the, the positives of what that experience brings. And here's kind of you know just one example. And then if we look at the next text, we actually see a tension between... You know, this is the first place that we read about this in the world. Because the Bilado said that we sent, the Kadosh Baruch sent us to the Galut because he wants that we tell the story about God all over the world and fits in the world. I guess, how does that sit? Maybe if we can reflect on that for a moment. How does that sit in a contemporary discussion about Israel diaspora relations? Today, if a person um, wanted to convert to Judaism, Israel probably wouldn't be the first place they would think of going because it's more difficult there. I'm not sure. No, I'm not sure because I'm a rabbi of a community in Israel. Half of them came from America, half of them come from Israel. The Americans are more Zionist and more love Israel than the Israelis. And when uh, I see people, the students, when I was Minister of Education, I met a lot of uh, students who came from America to Israel, secular, religious, reformer, conservative, everyone knows what it's to do, more or less. The, the Israeli secular does know nothing. So I'm not sure that people, I, I think that people who live in the diaspora walk about their identity more difficult than, than people who are born in Israel. But she was saying that someone who wants to join the Shoshotel in Gayer, it's Makshima love. Lord Shoshotel, it's Gayer, it's Gayer, it's Gayer, it's Gayer, it's Right, the practical, right, the practical question, the process, the rabbinic, right, right, meaning is much more difficult. But in terms of questions of reflection of identity, um, it is very interesting to think of American Jews. Certainly, I'll, I'll take my world of very practical in the trenches on the ground students, adolescents, you know, for the most part, for the last 10 years of my life, and now, kind of more, you know, communal writ large. But you can start a session in a class and say, okay, list the top 10 uh, markers of your identity. Right? There are, there are thousands. What would they be? Woman, feminist, sister, mother, whatever. It's always interesting for me to see how many of them, and I've done this in a lot of different contexts, will place Jew, American, Zion, right? What order? Well, whether it's even in the top five, right? Certain students think, I am a Democrat, I am a feminist, I am, right? And, and does that even play in the discussion? Because we're pressed to think about the identity in an age of kind of multicultural um, identity. Ten minutes, yeah. and then we could do this for hours. Right? Like I see it in your face. <laughs> uh, I'll leave it up to you how you want to 
since I took the first 10 minutes, I'm going to give the, you know, the last 10 minutes. I do want to just draw. If we were in a baby trash, I would say everyone go with your chavita for the next 10, 15 minutes and, and reflect upon this piece of narrative from the Babylonian Talmud because there's a lot here. Um, but I will just sum certain key points in this section because it really is um, a reflection where we see Israeli rabbinic sages and Babylonian rabbinic sages kind of reflecting on their experiences. And there's almost this like ping pong. Every time someone says something about how wonderful Israel is, and we have like a, you know, the ba you know, Babylonia is actually, you can't leave Babylonia to go to another land. You violate a, you know, a positive commandment. And we see this kinds of, um, you know, I invite you to read it, but we see a number of statements that in some ways are very reductive. We end up seeing each side kind of in their own self-interest. I kind of wish it weren't so reductive and there was more of a sense of being out for the other side. Um, but you do see like this, you know, character Babylonian sage, Rabbi Yehuda, kind of over the course of this whole text, intensifying the view of what it means to live in exile. Um, and, and ultimately, almost equating Israel and Bavel in terms of, they, you know, they exist in one pasuk, in one verse, they're parallel, and so we have this kind of like intensification, and then as that happens, you have an intensification on the other side, also, the, at the exact same time, kind of the Israeli uh, rabbinic sages who are intensifying in their world point of view. So we have a precedent, that's really why this text is kind of a precedent for what it means to grapple with that experience of being a diasporic people. I mean, it's not a new question, it's an age-old question. The end of this statement actually, you know, as the Babylonian sage Rabbi Huda gets more intense, so too the Israeli sages get more intense until almost we start talking about the afterlife. There's no afterlife for right, Jews in the, in the diaspora as there is in Israel. And suddenly, that to me, my legal training kicks in here, you then kicked into a totally different realm when you're no longer talking about the reality on the ground. When you start talking about the afterlife, um, it's almost like appealing to, to beyond what's reasonable. Um, and, and that actually, and with this I'll end, is almost a concession of, well, it's really hard. It was really hard under Roman occupation to say that life in Israel was great, right? It wasn't. It was a lot better in Babylonia. So the argument then has to be we're kind of one up in each other in this argument and then appealing to something that's beyond kind of the, the ordinary. And that I mean, speaks to me in terms of how our conversations about Israel and diaspora, positive, negative, blessing, curse, um, it's a dialogue. And it always was a dialogue, and that dialogue intensifies, and as one ups and ramps up, then the other will ramp up. And, um, and when you jump out of this playing field of the normal discourse and conversation and appeal to something else, then the conversation kind of, it takes on a whole life of its own. But to engage in the dialogue is something that like, Jews have been doing for thousands of years. And so this conference is you know, it's incredible, it's amazing, to see how many people are here. But we're really engaging in a Jewish project that, um, that has historical roots, intellectual roots, and spiritual roots in many ways. So I say only one thing about, I think that for me, the, the Mishnah that's wrote in Israel, and that's from Bavel. So they said, I live in Hebrew and you just take it to English. Yeah. The next page, the Roman Europa. I think that's wonderful to end with this. Uh, so after Sukkot, when we start to cry uh, to rain. So the Tanakama, the first time, said that we started in Gimel in Malchishvan. Rabban Gamliel Omer Beshivabo. Seventh day of Malchishvan. It's a very important day because this is my day of my marriage, so it's a wonderful day. It's starting to rain. It's starting, it's starting to rain. And you know that in, in Polish, they say that if the rain in the day of wedding, it's because the Chakam uh, de Kala like chocolates. Yeah, yeah, really. And they like chocolates. So, so Rabbi Gamir said, in Zayin Malcheshvan. Why? 15 days after Sukkot. Why? Because we have to wait that the end of the people from Bavel came to his home. So it's a wonderful example how in Israel, they don't say, who cares? Stay here. No. We wait 15 days in Israel because we need that the last of the, of the citizens from Bavel 
come to him home, and then we start to pray in Israel to reign Israel. For me, it's a wonderful example about relationships between Jews in the Israel and the in diaspora. Let me ask you, in metaphor, if people in Israel would like to wait 15 days to the Jews in the diaspora. <laughs> listen, listen, it's a wonderful example. Who want to stay 15 days? You know, it's agricultural society, it's not like today. We need the rain. We need it. And we stay because we wait to the people from the diaspora. They have home. How do you say mashal? Parable. It's a parable to our life today. It's a parable. And for me, it's, it can be the, the sentence of this conference. If prime minister, president, rabbis, leaders, teachers, educators, know to wait 15 days to the brother from the diaspora. That's the question. I think it might be difficult because I always barely wait until the light turns. <laughs> 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 okay, good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 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 Two more minutes. Two more minutes. One more. Wait, how much time? Two, more Two minutes. Comments, observations. Yeah, I like the story. I don't know. Can you, maybe can you say something about the great story about why the second day of Yontif? is the most spiritual, is it has a special spirituality to the second day, which is only celebrated, of course. You want to know the real the answer? Well, the story. The story. It's a good story. It's a nice, <laughs> the real answer is the Hasidic story answer. First of all, I like the Hasidic story. Yeah. You know what? Because, um, there's no translation into English. So because I wanted to. No, because I didn't want it to. Honestly, I translated and then I didn't want it to be a Maybe you can tell English. But you can, you can read. Why don't you read it so we have the language okay. and then I'll. Uh, okay, in Hebrew. Yeah. Last, um, page number four. The very last. I, I gave it to you. Yeah, perfect. Below the begging. Pam Hart, Shabbat the Yehudi Kadosh, Mipsisha, it's the Magid Mikoshnitz. Okay, so one time the, the holy Jew from Mipsisha sat with the Magid Mikoshnitz. בשעודת שבת שאל המגיד את האורח, היי לי גריות, יהודי קדוש. אמור לי, מדוע אני מרגיש קדושה והרע יותרה דווקא ביום טוב שני של גלויות המתקיים רק בחוץ לארץ? So he asked at the Shabbat meal, the Magid asked his guest, היי לי גריות, a holy Jew, tell me, why do I feel a, a higher level of holiness, specifically on the second day of Yom Tov, second holiday in exile. That happens only, takes place only outside of Israel. The, the holy Jew says, so it is. When a man, I mean, I'm trying to fight. That's an argument, right, just quarrels. Right? Uh, but, uh, right. uh, you know, fights with his wife, and then afterwards he makes up with her. Their love has, you know, then their love is, is, has expanded, has grown. So when he heard this, he kissed the Magid on his forehead. And, oh, sorry, the Magid kissed the forehead of the, the visitor, and he said, you've enlivened me. So I think that, that the meaning of this story is that, that God say us that if you live in the diaspora, you are not alone. It's the start to peace again between the Jews and God. That's the story. But I think that the real answer that the Puske al take two days because we need more identity in the, in the diaspora. So one day is not enough. So in Israel, you know, the atmosphere gives you the identity. In the diaspora, you need more days to feel it. And that's the reason that a family love, as opposed to brotherly rivalry, let's finish this session formally. If you have more questions, maybe Shai should have an answer. But uh, thank, thank you for your energy. Thank you. Thank you for learning. Your generosity.